All right, guys. Today we have <laughs> Karina Krep and Heather Harvey. Hey, how are you guys? How you how you's doing? Welcome to the Corrective Culture Podcast. Oh, thanks for having us, guys. We're super excited to to meet you and beyond and and yeah, talk about all the good stuff. Hell yeah. 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 You guys are holding it up on the other side of the planet. I'm in New York. <laughs> Heather's in Calgary. You guys are like literally holding up the other side of the <laughs> planet. So much enthusiasm. It has leaked all the way across the globe into our bedrooms. It's really, yeah, really great. Well, That's thank crazy. You. It's like yeah. one big family. Hey? It, it's is, like, hey. it really does feel like that. I know. And it, it's really. It cool. really is. Yeah. Mm. It's cool um, talking to a couple like females in the, in the Czech stuff too, because we haven't really heard heard or spoke to as many and but there's a full community out there and it, and it's so powerful it's so powerful because a lot of people may may listen to us just purely for like some fitness stuff or some basic health stuff but haven't gone too deep into i remember the old check course right uh what is it equal but not the same where it's like yeah oh, yeah, yeah. Right. whereas how women and, and and men are so different but in the in the industry it's barely touched on you know, it's barely touched on. And I remember I did the holistic healing for a women course uh, a couple of years ago. And mm-hmm. I, from, from a man's perspective, it was just gold. Hey, cause it's, it's just, you don't know what you don't know. And, and you hear these little things that a woman would be feeling that w- wouldn't even register in a guy's head. But now I'm more aware of that for my future relationships and whatnot and the little things. And it's a, it's just a whole different world. So it's so cool talking to you, isn't it? You both IMS five and, um, just yeah so so educated so yeah welcome yeah it's crazy like ims5 if you don't know over here like there's probably only like i could count on one hand like the people that i know in australia that have done ims5 so we've got two ims5s here which is sick (laughs) so we've got a lot to learn from you guys (laughs) it's been a journey for both of us we've both been in the check system for a really long time it took us took us time to get through because we've both been raising kids and everything kind of throughout. And I think that's one of the things that I, you know, one of the best things about the Czech system is it does open up your eyes that like you can't train everyone the same. Like everyone that comes to you is going to be a different case. It's never going to be, you know, they come in with, you know, they might have the same things like forward head posture. They might have kyphosis. They might have, you know, hyperlordosis, but it's going to display in a completely different way from a male to a female. It's going to, you know, depend on what's going on mentally, emotionally in their lives. And, you know, so it's never going to be just this set program that you can give to everyone that's going to work for everyone. So it's really a lot of dissecting and problem solving and, you know, really, really using that totem pole to bring yourself to that place to figure out what's going on in all the different bodies that you get to that you get to work with it keeps it very exciting i think like knowing uh yeah every every single person you come in is so individual and i always find that i end up learning so much from each client and i think that that's the coolest thing it's like it keeps it exciting like i could never imagine going to like a being a physio and nothing against physio because i love them but going to the same job every day and just treating every client with the same thing for me I just, that's why I was like, oh my God, check. And also being that I was a grade eight dropout and I could just make something of my life. I was like, fuck yeah, this is sick. Paul did it. Yeah. Grade eight (laughs) dropout. I'm an (laughs) ex-convict. You know what I mean? And and it's like. um, All in. Yeah. All in. All in. All in. Yeah. You can change your life. Yeah. You can. And you know, I went, I, well, we both did. I went to university for five years and got my physical education and came out of there and I was like, well, now what? Like, what do I do now? I had no idea what to do with myself after that. And then started with, with my Czech education. And, you know, it's so beautiful because you go and you learn and then you go and you apply it and then you go and you learn and then you build on your skills. And so you're constantly like integrating what you're learning. And I can come out of, you know, IMS five and I, I know what I am. I know what I want to do. I have this like, really beautiful skill set that I can offer people where it's like yeah you come out of uni or or college with a degree and you're still kind of like well I don't really know where to take this or you know Mm. what my skill set is or what I have to offer with what I with what I got from there yeah so I mean I think 
so cool about the check system is I think when I first started helping people with and through their bodies, I thought that there would be a cookie cutter. And that's what I was looking for. So if they come in with this, then I do this. So tell me what to do. If I come in, they come in with this, then I do this. And, you know, Matt likes to say, and and I love quoting Matt Walden because of he's so wise in oh, his yeah. apocalypse, right? And what he really brought to clarification with for me was it's we are not going by prescription. It's not this for that. That's the that was the problem. It's the the active listening. Mm. I listen to their body, I listen to their soul, and then I listen also to their words. And with those things all together, we can co-create a truth. And then, you know, if their their words are not matching what I'm hearing in their body, then we can, that opens up the conversation of like, I hear you saying that, but what I'm seeing and feeling is, right? And now we're really getting into this human, this beautiful human who came to us for help, not just to, you know, go do some external rotation. Wow. Yeah, that's magic. Yeah, it's um really cool hearing you say active listening because I'm I'm currently doing a mentorship with Diane Lee and she does <laughs> the same thing with but with the body, you know, and um in the sense of sh- like she'll grab a shoulder and she goes, "No, let's do active listening," and then she'll let go and feel which way it pulls, and it's it's almost a, a creative brain mindset of still something pretty logical and then using the logic to think, "Oh, what it's pulling that way? What could do that?" So it's still like, I know it's sort of a segue off there, but um, it's just. This is exactly it, right? So now you have the knowledge, but you had to have the base knowledge, Mm. right? To apply, those are smart hands, yeah, right? And an open Mm. heart. And when people touch us with those things, miracles can happen. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I I saw when I was over, I did IMS4, I was talking to Paul and um. I was like, I feel like my, my check practicing got worse. Like it, it honestly, I started getting less good results, like towards IMS three. Cause I think I was overthinking things too much. And before that, I wouldn't say worse results, but I just had a couple of challenging clients at the time. And I, I told Paul, I told Paul that, and I was like, I'd feel like I was just trusting my soul through IMS one, two, and where we were working, me and Cal were both working with a lot of clients and I got s- some crazy results. Like just, you know, big stuff happening. And I was like, wow, this is sick. And then I got over there and I was like, I feel like I've kind of lost my way a little bit and stopped asking my soul what I, I remember specifically. I'd be like, hey, soul, connect me with their soul. What what can I do to help this person? And then I'd go to the shoulder, something like that. And it took the guesswork out of it. And it really, it was always right. Uh, and I stopped maybe for a year thinking about that and feeling just getting into that. Yeah. And I remember Paul goes, well, <laughs> he goes, there's the work. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, fuck, that's probably the biggest thing I took from, from the four. I was like, okay, like it's, it, it's applied knowledge, but then the feeling like you have that connection with this human being and you can go to what feels right because you're probably feeling what they're feeling. And it's so magic once you connect into that. May, again, it makes it so much more fun. It is. And I think, you know, I think it was on the first day of IMS 5. Paul stands in front of us and he says, so everything that you've learned up till now, you can basically forget about <laughs> it because the only thing that matters is what we're going to learn about in I miss five because it's the top of the totem pole, right? It's mm. the psyche. Yeah. And, and so like, and he just like, just integrates it. And in basically, if you don't address that, like if you don't connect to soul, if you don't see what the driver is, then then you're never going to be able to make the changes or make the changes stay or, you know, create the, the fullness that you can when you're, when you're coaching with someone and integrating all those, all those modalities. Mm -hmm. I had a client that I worked with for a year after I missed for a huge Atlas subluxation. So she was out to the right. You could like, it was visible, just, you didn't even have to assess it. You could see it. And she had about, 12 centimeters of forward head posture. And so wow. we spent, you know, it took us six weeks to get it back into, into place, which is a pretty short time. <laughs> and then after six weeks, she came back to me and she was completely out again. Like you could just see it. And that forward head posture was back. The Atlas was back and it all came down to something happening from that mental, emotional, 
you know, level where she felt like she was wearing the weight of the world on her, on her head. And it just like, just pulled her all out of balance again. Mm. So it was just such a good representation to me. Like if you don't dive into that, like if you don't dive into Mm. their soul, you can make changes, but they might not be lasting. They might not be the, you know, the permanent changes that we're looking to help people with. What did you do to, to, to fix that? Like, did you, did you start like, you know, with words or did you um, sit with her and do some zone work or did you do some meditation or did you just talk to her about that chakra and opening up or? Yeah. So like a lot of what I work with when I work with the coaching is actually like the survival archetype. So looking at the victim and the prostitute and the child and the, and the saboteur and just getting into, you know, what choices are they making? What things do they keep thinking? How are they creating the situations in the light in their life? Like what is their, their viewpoint on, you know, what is creating the pain in their body or what's creating, you know, the, the problem in the relationship. And it's just such an empowering place to come from to look at it from the standpoint of, well, me, you know, I'm creating this in my life. I'm creating the feelings and the emotions and the issues that I'm dealing with. So if I'm creating it, then what can I do to, to solve that problem? How can I come at it from a different viewpoint so that I can, you know, let go of those things and see them from, from a different perspective and that different perspective of there's purpose in my pain. There is, there's a place that I can come from that this is going to be a learning experience that I'm going to grow from this. Then we're okay with discomfort. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of like, you know, training when you're in the gym and you know, it gets really hard, but you know, you're in there for a reason, then it's okay to push through it. But if say you're like out and you're, maybe running a marathon and you have no desire to run, um, but you're doing it anyways, it's harder to push yourself through that. But as soon as you attach that purpose and there's, you know, there's validity in the discomfort, then, then you're like, okay, well, there's a reason why I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. And there's a reason why my soul has to experience this. So, so I'm okay with moving through this and I can look at it from a different perspective. So, a lot of work around, yeah, soul contracts, around archetypes, around, um, yeah, just the bird's eye view of the situation. Mm. Um, with uh, when you look into the archetype, because I mean, Jake got me onto the book. What was the Caroline Mice book? The um, Carol. Yeah, sure. yeah, and she's so good. Yeah. I love, I love listening to her. Right? It's awesome. Like, yeah, it's a nice balance. You it's know. Like about um, it right the, mm. the one that i always <laughs> the one that I always sometimes found it harder to wrap my head around was finding um like the, the saboteur and describing the saboteur archetype to people that were unsure what that is because it's it's easier to sometimes see victim and people and and child and even totally. sometimes seeing victim and child as, as similar things right because i know it's a blend and and yeah. how, how would you describe like if you were to summate the archetype, those, those survival archetypes, I know in, in, you know, in a condensed version, like how would you do that? Especially, yeah. especially for me personally, the <laughs> saboteur. So the saboteur is all about truth. So when you're looking at it, it's something that's an illusion in your life, something that is not true, but it's a programming or story that you keep telling yourself. So you keep reenacting it because you have a belief around it. So like Carolyn Meist does a really beautiful job of, you know, um, creating the shadow and the light. So the saboteur is kind of the, the shadow of the magician and the magician right. is all about revealing the truth. So a really good example of the saboteur is like, say you believe that you can't be on time. You're constantly late for everything. And so you're actually creating law of attraction you could even leave your house on time but then you're going to hit every red light along the way because you have this belief that you can't be on time Mm -hmm. um but it's not true you're perfectly (laughs) capable of being on time everyone is right so as soon as you dismantle the belief and you know you you let go of the illusion that you can't be on time then you're able to start creating the situations 
to live in the light. And, also, and- the saboteur, right, that served us at one time, right? Because let's say that you believed you couldn't be on time because you felt really special when you walked in last. Mm-hmm. And everyone would be like, oh, look who's graced us with their presence. Karina is here and now we can begin, mm-hmm. right? So there was maybe a reward at some time mm-hmm. in our life for the bad behavior and the saboteur continues showing up with a poor behavior even when it costs like you know you could be fired right like (laughs) that's it that's it now Mm. you're fired and you're like i don't know then the victim comes in i don't know why this keeps happening to me it was the traffic you know yeah Yeah. so it's the (laughs) these are the belief systems that we buy into this is the myth that we believe about ourselves and you know the empowering thing is that you can always rewrite your story at any point in time you can decide hey that's really not me actually i don't i i like to disintegrate that part of me that once attached to that habit and you know usually with a lot of grace and and gratitude in my life all of my survival archetypes served me and then when i see like them not serving me i have to say thank you and goodbye that's it yeah fuck that's good and i i i for me i've been doing this thing lately with when i leave my dogs i don't know what it is i feel so um detached and I'm like I'm like I know a bit of a segue but it freaks me out and I have this belief right of like it's not going to be okay and I've been doing some inner work lately on on that and I was like fuck I've been so unconscious of this thought whenever I leave my dogs I feel like I'm leaving a part of myself or something I don't know it's something deeper but Mm -hmm. I was like oh my god I've been unaware of that and I've been unaware of that since I've had my dog it's actually been a big stressor in my life, but I've been unconscious of it. And I was like, wow, just being aware of that has created so much uh, f- good good feeling, I, I would say. It feels amazing to just be able to go, you know what? That's that's a belief. That's that's not real. That hasn't happened. That's fear. It's, mm. it's something other. Mm. And just being aware of it has, like it just brings up this inner joy. You know, you know that feeling when you're like, oh, I saw it. <laughs> I can, yeah. I, can, I can I can I can see my shit. <laughs> well, and I think that, yeah, I think it's so important like even with like the survival archetypes, like when we become aware of them, just like Karina said, it doesn't mean they disappear. And yeah. it doesn't mean that as soon as we become aware of it that we can drop it. Like I know at times, you know, I'll get stuck in a victim mentality and it's one of the ones that I have like an aversion to. I'm like, no, I don't I don't want to sit there. I don't want to be there. I don't want to resonate with that. But it might take me a day or two to like talk my way out of it or think my way out of it. But I think that's, yeah, that's awesome, Jake. I know that (laughs) feeling every time I walk out of the door and he's looking out at me like, I'm so sorry I'm leaving you, buddy. (laughs) I know, I know. And not, yeah. it is. But, you know, it's so funny because in our when we were writing our chapter, um, we call it uh, becoming a guide, which both of you already are guides because you have clients and you move people toward and through things. Cool. Um, but we when we were writing the chapter, we originally were like, oh, well, this is our chapter on parenting. And we decided no, because it, it's not the exclusively like Heather parents, people who were born from other people right? Mm. We both, we all have dogs, mm. right? So like the parenting thing, that sense of like that feeling that you have, Jake, is a, a real parenting feeling. Like it's yeah. the sense of like a piece of my heart is outside of my body. Oh my God, something terrible could happen while I'm not there to protect, to guide, to buffer, to, you know, Zamboni that, you know, that he doesn't probably fly in Australia, <laughs> but you know, like that sense of of I've, I have a piece of me outside of me, something I care about so much. How do I, you know, that do the ultimate Buddhist detachment? Yeah. detachment? Which you have to, right? Don't you think? Like, I think that's the, I think it's like the key to life is to is to learn how to not lose your center, because even if you have a child, and I don't have one yet. <laughs> But even if you have a child, it's they're on their own soul contract and their own journey. And I think that well, like 100%. that would be so hard. And I think maybe even more as a mother, that would be so hard to let that be and not want to control that. I, I feel I'm actually 
it's a fear of mine that comes up for having children because I'm like, what if something went wrong? I'm already in that, you know, I'm already seeing that. And I'm like, fuck, like, has that been, that's hard, huh? (laughs) That's like, I think probably my biggest aha moment as a mom was that like, I probably spent the first, I don't know, like 12 years of my oldest uh, daughter's life trying to make her happy and to like problem solve for her and like make sure that she didn't experience any like hard things in her life or if there was hard things I want to always cheer her up and so it was like this pressure to like just always keep things good keep things cheery keep things happy and then that's exactly what I realized I'm like oh I'm actually not in charge of her happiness yeah. she has to figure that out because I'm not always going to be there she needs to have that internally and if i save her from every hard thing then i'm robbing her of her soul contracts she's not going to be able to experience the things that she needs to experience and be able to have those hard times and find her her center to find her balance in it so it was kind of like a like dusting of hands as a mom and it was so freeing to just be like oh you're upset yeah. Well, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But if you just want to sit in it, that's that's okay too. So, okay. so yeah, it's um, it's, it's one of those things that uh, as moms, well, and I think as parents, you just like you have the innate protector in you. You want to keep them, you want to keep them safe, and you want to make sure that you know no harm comes to them. But yeah, it's just it's robbing them sometimes of of their life experiences. And I think it's really important when they're little, like when they're infants and we have this really powerful, you know, buffering. Yeah, I have never felt my shadow. So I really I knew clearly I would kill anybody who I would. I knew that. I mean, that, you know, that was an easy, of course. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) right. That that didn't. I didn't have like a negotiate. Oh, I would, you know, I lost all sense of this kind of peace loving. I was like, no, no, that this mine Mm. stay back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's letting out the tether, right? Like, you know, he's like, you, you hope that your dog is intelligent enough. You know, I came home the other day. I do not know how my dog did it, but like chewed through a can. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Just to say. Just like, So then you're like trying to piece together how many pieces of metal are left, right? And you know, you'd think like, gee, I hope my dog would be smart enough not to do such a stupid thing, but they he did it. Yeah. And there there you go, right? (laughs) So like and then, you know, now it's the question of now the real parenting part, like, do you take him to get the x-rays, to you know, blah blah blah. So like it's not they are gonna fall. Like my kids did parkour, right? There were broken bones. But it's really about standing by going, you're, that's great job. No, oh, don't worry. Brush it off. Get back up. You know, we used to have a, we used to have a saying, I'd kiss them as they go out to do their parkour. No blood, no bones. That was my rule, right? Don't break <laughs> any bones. Don't come home with anything bleeding. And other than that, you've learned something, right? A couple bruises here and there, a little humility here and there, yeah. right? So I think it is that kind of that letting go. Um, and, and we do the same thing with our clients. I, you know, Heather knows I over mothered my clients and over codependent them for most of my clients have been with me for decades. <laughs> right. And yeah. I've been nurturing them. And one of the things that Paul clarified for me in last like three months ago was like, Karina, let the birds out of the nest. Mm. You know, they, yeah. they've got to fly. Right. It's, mm. it's not helpful to keep coddling them if they don't do the work do the work with them, right? Bring it all the way back down to, you know, because I would continue to try and progress them and they just, they didn't do the basics, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's always kind of bringing it back to the totem pole, bringing it back to simplicity. And that, you know, that's what has taken so long to learn in the check system is the complexity. And it was when you were talking about the IMS3, it's exactly what Paul used to say, right? Isolate and then integrate. And it's in the isolation that we get like, okay, so let me test all of the shoulder function. And then, okay, so, okay, so this, you know, and then we get like in here. And Mm -hmm. just like you said, we forget our connection, right? Because what I always, I write down what my soul says right at the top. And then I do all the tests and I go, oh, she was right. 
or he was right. Yeah, sick. So, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think if you do that, you're going to find like you're a genius. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, write the soul. Yeah, well, what, what, I'll write what my soul picks up first. That's a great idea. I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Um, for, for if we went to the child and the victim and the differences between the two and how to, how to, uh, not see one as the other or, or if you could explain the, that for the listeners, cause a lot of listeners wouldn't be used to the archetypal model, but it's, it's just gold. It is gold. The child is really like the child's innate. They're all innate within all of us, but the child really, we, you know, we live, we experience the child and it's not being able to take care of ourselves. Like when we're little, we, we need our parents to take care of us. We need them to meet our basic needs. We need them to make our decisions for us because we're not at a level of consciousness to do that yet. So in reality, the child is all about um, not being in a place to be responsible for yourself. And so as we, as we, as we should, as we age, we should individuate we should become adults but sometimes we get stuck in that child or things that happen in relationships or life pushes us back into the child so the child on the opposite end it, it's about responsibility but it's about becoming sovereign about you know gaining self-responsibility becoming responsible for your health becoming responsible for your decisions and your choices and your actions and your thoughts and and words and deeds and so I think the child is one that we'll see in a lot of our clients when they come to us in the beginning because they haven't taken responsibility for their health a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. They put it on to doctors or they put it on to, you know, um, therapists, physiotherapists. They want, they want someone to heal them. And when they get to a certain point, and this is usually as check practitioners, I think is what we see. Someone's kind of at the end of their line. They've seen the chiro, they've seen the physio, they've seen, you know, the psychologist, they've done all the things and they're still sitting in pain or they're sitting in the same place they were before. So, you know, they, they seek out a check practitioner and that's about like, okay, well, this is what you need to do. This is what we're going to explore. And these are, this is the program that you're going to follow, but you have to do it. Mm. And, you know, that was one of the most simple things that Paul said in I am this five. He's like, if you give someone a gong and say you give them a 30 day gong of, you know, doing Tai Chi for 30 days and they come back to you and they haven't done it, you don't, you don't move from there. Now you go, you take them down and you do you do Tai Chi with them mm -hmm. until they're able to mm -hmm. do that 30 day gong or whatever you've assigned to them. Mm -hmm. Because until they can be accountable to themselves for that, they're not ready to progress. Or you send them on their way and you're like, come back to me when you've done this 30 day gong and then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, that was a really hard concept because people are coming to me and I want to, you know, I want, just like Karina said, it's you want to see the progression and you want to give them more constantly. You want them to feel like they're, you know, getting what they, what they want from you, but to just, you know, for them to come and be like, oh, you didn't do that, that Tai Chi. Well, guess what? We're going to do Tai Chi. <laughs> and so that's the perfect example of the child. It's like, okay, you want the change. You want, you know, the relationship you want, you know, the abundance in your life. Well, these are the choices that you're making. Um, and you're going to have to take that responsibility on for yourself. But again, as soon as we do that, that self-responsibility brings a lot of empowerment into our lives. And then the victim is all about power. So it's as soon as we give our power away to you know, person, place, or thing. It can be a situation. It can be a person in a relationship. It's, it can even be to like a disease or a disorder or pain in her body. Um, I have like, when you look at, have you guys done a lot of coaching with like cancer patients no. or anything I've, like that? I've only had, two, I've had two. Yeah, no, I haven't. You've had two. Mm. I always find there's two mentalities there that can come. There's, you know, the, the client that comes and they're like, I have this diagnosis. 
I want to know what I can do about it. And then there's the other client that will come and be like, I have this. I don't know why this is happening to me. And the doctors aren't helping me. And so one's living in their victim, one's living in their in in their warrior is really what it is. They're looking at it from, okay, this is this is what's happening to me right now. What can I do about it? What decisions, what choices can I make? What how can I empower myself to change it? And as soon as we give our power back like that, then we're coming from a place of, okay, I actually have the ability to make lasting change. Whereas if we get stuck in that victim of, well, I don't know why, then we can't look back at the past and be like, what decisions, what thoughts, what, you know, programmings led me to this point that I need to address. And then who's going to heal me? Like, if these people, if the doctors can't help me, then what do I do? And so it can be really defeating to, to stay in that victim. So it's always the transition from taking the power back with the victim mm. and moving into the warrior to, to make your mark, to, to make the choices that are going to bring you into a place of, yeah, creating what you want to happen. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and, just and the, I think there's a two good questions just to clarify definitely. those, right? The the eternal the eternal child, which is what I call it, because everyone's a child, mm -hmm. right? And and then you have the option to be an adult. Is the question there is where is my power in this situation? And then you know that's the conversation opener. And then for the people who are living in their victim. Right. The the question that I ask them is, why is this happening for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those things are very clarifying, right? Because it moves us away from, oh my God, this happened to me. I can't believe I just got over this and now I got this and oy oy. Why is this happening for you? What what lesson are you supposed to learn? What have you not learned in the past? And if it is a pattern, there's probably you're the common denominator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's life gets fun when you start looking at things as that life gets fun when you look at them as like things aren't just you know you're attracting things if someone walked in this is such a weird concept because josh saunders talk this jiu-jitsu guy talked to us about it the other day and he's like someone came in and uh beat you up at a bar it's like you could easily just say i was in the wrong place wrong time but then you could also look at it and be like well why why did that happen to me what what was i putting out there into the universe that led that you know, maybe it was some trauma from a kid that I needed some dad love or whatever. I don't know. It could be anything. But when you start looking at life as not as a victim, it makes it really fun. Hey. Yeah. It just makes it critical in a, in a beneficial way. Like how can I be better? And that's what. Yeah, always, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm always trying to do, always trying to do that. Um, for, for, and for the prostitute, that's <laughs> like, the, I only know that one as doing a job for money, for something you don't like, right? But is there, how do you see people playing that out in their life? The prostitute is, is all about values. So when it comes to the prostitute, it's like, okay, am I living in alignment with my values or am I giving up my values for gain? And I think that sometimes that gain can be different things. Like it can be, it can be monetary. It can be, it can be money. It can be whatever, you know, is important power. to you at that time. Power. Stuff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even like acceptance, you know, it's, and I find this, my kids are all athletes. And so like I live in a volleyball court and a dance studio. And a lot of the times, and sometimes I find that, you know, the dynamics within sports is, is so interesting when you look at it from the survival archetypes, because you'll see kids and parents and everything, um, letting go of, you know, they might not normally want to gossip about someone that might not be something they value, but to, fit in with the team or to fit in with, you know, the parenting um, group that is there, they'll, they'll let go of that. They'll step into their prostitute because they just want to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. or they just want to, you know, be included in what's happening in the team. So it's one of those ones that I think there's a very fine line and there's a place for the prostitute. 
So when you're building a business, um, you're, or you're working on a goal or, you know, like within a sport or something like that, sometimes you're going to have to live in your prostitute because even though you really value sleep, you might have to give up a little bit of sleep in the beginning to build that business. Yeah. Or you might have to, you know, there might be a business deal that there might be some shady parts that aren't quite in alignment with what you you believe to be true and right. But you have to step over that mark to to close that deal. So sometimes our, our prostitute serves us. But on the other end of the prostitute is the lover. And the lover is all about um, showing myself enough love to stay in alignment with my values and what I believe and who I want to be and with my legacy and my character and the integrity that I want to uphold within myself. So I'm not willing to cross that line or I'm not willing to give up on that value because uh, I love myself enough to, to stay in alignment. But so, yeah, there's always the light and the shadow and there's places for, for them all to be in us and a part of us. And it's just knowing when and where to step into those, um, that it's not going to pull you too far, far away from, would you say that legacy, Karina? Yeah. Like, and the I, we all of it, right? Cause if we're, you know, if we were all just working on our I, then it might be a really clear path for, you know, this is dream affirmative. I'm going to do this for sure. But then if we bring in the we and our partner, you know, is taking a job that's, you know, going to move us to Atlanta, right? Now, now there's a good negotiation. And this is the place where you go, okay, um, let's take this zigzag off of my path onto your path, right? For the, for the all, and then, you know, in two years, we'll zag back and we'll come back to my path and my play, right? So that mm. as we're negotiating relationships, we're always working kind of with our prostitute because we are saying, okay, I can't keep a hard and only line. And one of my favorite examples of this is the Dalai Lama. He was being interviewed by the vegetarian magazine, you know, and I, I love this story because for 19 years and this Paul cured me of this, but I was a, a, a dogmatic vegetarian <laughs> and um, I was a yogi and, and it was part of my dogma. And I really believed in that. It was part of my, pra my spiritual practice. And um, he was, Dalai Lama was being interviewed by this vegetarian magazine. They said, so you never eat meat. And I don't know if you've ever heard the Dalai Lama. He's a giggler. So he giggles, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I don't cook my own food. And so I'm very grateful. And oftentimes, he said, I am a guest at someone else's table. He said, so now the question is, as a Buddhist, is it more important to be kind or to be right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's magic. I am so there. So like our when our dogma gets in the way of our greater purpose, right? This is where we could be living in our prostitute, where we're where we give up the greater purpose of kindness to be so I does that meet? I am I'm so offended, right? Because what was his highest purpose? Like and that and as he said later in the article, he it was a, an act of kindness and generosity that they would feed him this really um amazing food but they coveted so the kindness you know all, we have to always be thinking about okay i gotta give i'm gonna give here i'm gonna go a little softer there and as a hugely i was you know raised in the military i i use a very black and white thinker i'm all in or i'm all out it's all good or it's all bad and one of the things that i've learned over the many years is that you know, there's a time and a place for everything, right? Those 19 years served me on my path. And now when people come to me and they say, I'm a vegan, you know, I'm not like, why are you crazy? You know, I'm like, okay, I hear that. Let's talk about your why. Mm. Is it serving you? How do you feel? You know, like, so that we can have the conversation instead of being reactive. And I'll say that this is one of the things that I think perhaps the female in the Czech system is maybe a little bit better at, although it's not very mar marketable, because one of the things that Heather and I learned was like, 
you know, if you're supposed to market yourself, you're supposed to market the negative. And we're just not good at that, are we? Mm. Mm-hmm. No, so, no, we're not good at that. We're not good at that <laughs> because we're in support of, okay, I see where you are, but I see where you want to go. How are we going to this, you know, I, you're not, you don't have much energy. So let's look at, you know, how is that affecting you? And so I just think that the prostitute, it does get a little muddy in there, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. Yeah. I think with the prostitutes too, is like, you know, I think of a time when I was first starting my business, I was, I was on my own with my, my three little kids. And, uh, I was, I, I was fear-based. There was a lot of fear in there. Like, I'm like, I have to provide for these three kids. It's up to me. And so I found myself living in my prostitute to my clients. I'm like, oh, you want to see me at 5 a.m.? Sure. You want to see me till 8 p.m.? Sure. Like whenever you want to come, I'm going to make it happen because I was living in fear of not being able to to take care of my kids. Mm. And so that led to like burnout, complete burnout and, and an injury that I had to take some time to heal and stuff like that. So it's a, you know, it's the... Paul's beautiful example that the pain teacher kicks in when we're not aware of what we're living in Mm -hmm. and the choices that we're making and living in those survival archetypes. So I had to like, I have some really um, clear cut boundaries now around, you know, when I'll see clients, how many clients a day that I'll see. And it's, it always amazes me how, when you do that and you set those boundaries and you know i work less than i ever did or i see less clients than i ever did but i'm more successful now Mm. than i ever was when i was living in that prostitute so it always serves us to become aware of it and and jump to the other side and then you know be aware of how you could jump into that if someone said to me i'll pay you you know three grand to see you at 5 a.m I'm probably going to say yes. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to say no to that, right? Yeah. yeah. So we have to pick and choose where it's coming from. But but yeah, it's just like, it's always that teacher. Like it taught me, you know, where I don't want to be. And so now I have that clear picture of, okay, this is, this is actually in alignment with my value. Of, you know, I love to make sure that I get eight hours of sleep at night and that, you know, I have time to take care of myself and then time to spend with my kids. And, and so it's, yeah, they're always teachers in our lives. They're there for a reason. I think um, what a, a really cool thing that I took that men wouldn't be aware of from the holistic healing for women course was that when a woman has a child with a man, assuming that man is the bread maker and he's going to work and, and she's at home with the children, is that then it, there's some sense of maybe subconscious and maybe conscious of survivability of that his needs have to come before hers because if he leaves her, then she's fucked basically, you know, in the sense of Clearly. like now I've got these kids, I've got to make money, rah, rah, what if he just runs off, you know, like all this, all of a sudden he gets, you know, it, what time's dinner, what, you know, all this sort of stuff like gets it so um, to make life good for him so that she's not left in that fear-based mindset and that for me was so sad i was like man that's so like because i think about like we're in the western world right and and now it's one one woman looking after whatever like you said three children instead of having a tribe of females there that can all help because really we're in tribes of like 100 people or whatnot so it's so different and it's harder it's harder than it would be you know um which is just crazy for guys listening of, of that. And it makes you, when you hear that, it makes you more empathetic as a male and want, and makes you want to nurture more to support that in, in whoever your partner is, you know? Mm. So don't even know what the question is in that, but I guess yeah, it's just no. a realization. Yeah, yeah. A, yeah. And I think with like also elders, like we mm. in the Western world, like we look at elders as if, you know, like a lot of uh, elders that I know are in a home, and just like off to the side and i'm like we it's weird like i think because we've grown up with the internet and stuff i don't know like the the elders have so much wisdom to give us or they did have so much wisdom to give us and i feel like like we we pride on ourselves on and the people that we're around is like one day i'd like to be a wise elder that can actually give back to and, and have a tribe around me and things like that and i'd like everyone in my in my circle to be looked after and 
I feel like that's, you know, like the I, we all thing is just like, it's so important. And it, it also leaves a legacy. Yeah. And, and not being sick. I think because we mm. say elders are sick now, it's all dementia and, you know, it's all sugar and that, whatnot. And I think about that in the same thing in a relationship, not being sick for your partner. Because if someone's yeah. eating shit and then all of a sudden they get cancer when they're 50 and then the income's gone, like all that stressor that most people, that wouldn't even cross their mind because the awareness of the, the shitty food every day isn't shitty to them, you know? Like it's, um, it's, it's just, there's so much going on. There's, there's, so, so, there's so many there's dynamics. So, you know? I know. There's so, so many, many archetypes It's a multivariate play. equation, this yeah. world. It is, yeah. it is hectic, <laughs> but um, it's fun. <laughs> for, for, you know, I was listening to... Paul had a podcast, um, I don't know, maybe it was last week, and he was talking with Mark Gaffney. Did you guys listen to that one? No, I haven't yet. Anyways, he was talking about, so, you know, with the dynamics, and Jake, you probably saw this with, you know, Angie and Penny and mm. Paul all raising Zoe and Mana. It's this, like, it's a little, you know, introduction to what, how important that village is, right? Mm. So Paul was talking about how, you know, he's really on a mission here. He's here to, you know, teach the masses how to love themselves is really what it is to find unconditional love. And so he spends a lot of his time, you know, researching and reading and, you know, teaching and all of these things. So he's, you know, he's the, he is the wise man that's, learning all the knowledge and applying all the knowledge and then penny is like well penny is amazing she's a machine <laughs> she's running the business and she's she's the pilot by trade but she's also a pilot of that business that she's taking it to a place where she can take paul's knowledge and you know direct it in the right places and make sure that the right people uh hear it and that you know it's out there in the world and then angie's embodying that and she's taking it and she is teaching mana and zoe oh. and she's embodying all those principles and all those you know things that you know we're learning now those kids are getting that at well what's i think mana seven and zoe's four right now i think it is like they are going to be you know, you think of where they're going to be when they're in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh -huh. They're just going to be, they're going to be amazing souls doing amazing things on this, on this planet because they were, they're being raised by that tribe. They have the wise men. They have, you know, mm. um, two mothers essentially, but, you know, the elders and, and you know, they have, they have a tri tribe of people that are raising them. And <laughs> that's something that I just feel like, it's something that we're all trying to get back to. Like when you look at the movement of, you know, I don't know very many Czechies or people today that don't want to get back to, you know, having some land and raising their food and being connected to the earth and, you know, living in communities where everyone is helping with that. And I think that's what that draw is. It's the, it's the draw that we've separated ourselves into homes. We put, you know, the elders into nursing homes because they're not well. And then so we're missing that connection and we're missing that, like, the stories and the songs and, you know, that the elders would bring to the children because that would be their job in that tribe or in that village. And then, you know, the, the youth, the teenagers would also be helping raising those kids and then everyone else would have a purpose, whether it's hunting or you know, growing food, or there'd be a medicine man, medicine woman, and everyone would have purpose in that tribe. And everyone would be implementing um, knowledge and wisdom and understanding mm. into, you know, bringing you know, those I, so like Taking the benefit of what's happening right now, you know, corrective culture is, you guys are a little younger than me. I know that's shocking. But... <laughs> <laughs> this time in your life, you already are leading this whole group of people. And it doesn't, their age is irrelevant. It's a group of people who are seeking something. And now at any moment, I could pick up and open my Apple podcast and listen to what you got, the questions you're, you know, the enthusiasm, the people that you have on. And together, 
because I'm a, because I'm listening, I'm a participant, I'm part of your all, mm. right? And you guys are each eyes and you're each, a, you're a we together. And so you've already created that wise man, warrior group. And what's so impressive is that the, con- this is what I dreamed about last night. So Heather was like, what are we going to talk about? I was like, I'll tell you what I dreamed about. <laughs> nah, sick. I dreamed about, I was sitting and I was sitting in meditation and suddenly something was handed to me and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And I was, I was listening to one of your, um, I think I was listening to the Matt Walden podcast a couple days ago and Matt said something and I meet with Matt every week. And so there's a lot of stuff that Matt has said that I know. Mm. And like, so it's always like, oh my God, I didn't, he's never said that to me. I didn't know that. <laughs> Fully. And so I, like this sense of like, through you, I was handed something that I didn't know. And what's so exciting is that any minute of any day, I can decide, oh, I have 10 minutes or this client is late, or let me tap into the collective unconscious and find out what do I need to learn today? What could I, how could I grow today? And you guys are part, you you just handed me something Mm. like from a different time zone and a different season, you handed me this beautiful gift. So thank you for doing what you Well, it's the same. I feel like I've learned so much today, like even just with the archetypes, I can't help, but when you're talking about it, apply it to myself. And I feel like that's with um, a lot of our listeners and a lot of all of our podcasts, it's always it's about getting better and it's about getting happier. Yeah, about just bringing more joy into your life and more really? truth into your life. And I just feel like that's just like the ultimate lights my heart up. So Yeah, and uh, when you guys speak about the archetypes, I can really see that you're speaking about it from like, oh, yeah, I'm going to listen because they speak about it from an, a, a conceptual understanding, you know. Um, like how Matt talks about the body, you know, a very conceptual understanding. Like, and when you guys were just speaking about that, then I was like, oh yeah, they, they really understand. They really yeah, understand. It's so like authentic. Authentic, it's like, yeah. yeah. It comes out, flow state, right? And like when I'm reading Carolyn, I'm still interested in all that, but it's like I'm learning it, you know? Like it's, and and because it's, it's very, I guess here in Australia, especially like I wasn't open to any of that, especially as a young male, you know? It's just like, like you said, it's on TV or, whatever you just don't you don't hear that who's alan watts who's ram das who's who are these people you know it's there's such a but now we all know them they're so common to the because we're in the same community but to the average high school boy or just getting out like i was especially in the scene of getting out of prison and getting into mma and cage fighting and all of a sudden i'm l- sitting there listening to caroline mace <laughs> you know survival yeah. archetypes yeah, yeah. it's like it's okay, unusual okay. <laughs> yeah and i knew it was unusual and that's why when doing this thing with Jake, I, that's how it had to start because I knew, I knew it was rare, and I knew that I'd never seen it done before. But I knew we were doing it. I knew people were yearning for it because I was yearning for it, and he was yearning for it, and it was all just happened naturally. Like I said, corrective culture. I don't even know. It's all just happened to us. It felt like um, just doing what we wanted to do. It was never a big plan. There was no big business model and let's do this and post three times a day you know what i mean it was just all just happened and now i feel like we're just sitting here and it's yeah, yeah. No, i know i know and it i have had like guilt come up at times because i've been like i've 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 worked very hard at, to get to get places in my life but nothing has come as easy as corrective culture has come to us yeah like and we work hard i guess but it doesn't feel like work <laughs> It's yeah. like I I do it all day every day anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I look at other people trying really hard to yeah. sort of replicate and I feel sorry because I'm like, oh, I didn't feel like I didn't have to do all that, you know? I didn't I I even feel like with the body I barely studied. You know, like and it's and Oh well you did though. I know, yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> From an outside view looking in, yeah. it's like it's all he talked about. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So it's because yeah. you loved it. Yeah, because I loved it. But I was never good at sitting down and writing notes down and all that sort of shit. I just I just, had, I just want to sit and listen to it. And then I sort of remember it, you know. Um, but I was never good at studying, you know. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to ask is, was was there a, a crisis that got you into your journey of health? Was there something you had to deal with that, that initiated your, your progress? whoever wants to well for me like my journey started I was always an athlete growing up um I that was 
that was what I lived for. I lived for sports. I lived for, you know, being involved on a team. Um, soccer was my my main sport. That's what I was competitive in. But I was always, you know, like I I kickboxed and I ran and I, you know, was always snowboarding and and everything. So my whole world was was physical. So that's what drove me to go and get my physical education in college. And then and I started personal training. And I just knew like when I was personal training that there was this like there was something missing. Like you could only like I would see it and I'd be like, well, I can only take them so far. You know, I can only get them if I'm seeing someone once a week, there's not much I can do to actually help them. And so that's when I found um, the track system. And so I started with like scientific back training when it was still on DVDs. Mm-hmm. You'd get your little DVDs in the box <laughs> and you'd watch them all. Um, and really what drove me, so I took, I took, I, well, it was still exercise coach in, I think it was like 2015 or 2016. And I went to that course and this is right when, when I was talking about living in my prostitute, I had been on my own with my three littles and uh, I had a labral tear in my hip and all the doctors and physios and chiros were telling me the only thing you can do is have surgery. That's the only thing that is going to fix this. And I was in constant pain, but not enough pain to make me stop doing anything. I'm like I can still squat, I can still lunge. But if I sit like on an airplane for more than a couple hours, I'm in so much pain that like, I want to cry. And so I got down to this course. Do you guys know Nicole Devaney? Uh, Not personally, but I know her, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so she was, she was my instructor. And so we went through the, you know, everything. And at the end, well, you guys know, you have to make a program for someone else in the class to go over and to correct posture and everything like that. And so I'd said to the lady that had made my program for me, I'm like, this is great. I'll do this, but I'm not going to stop doing everything that I'm already doing. Like I had this mentality of go, go, go. I'm an athlete. I'm going to go hard no matter what I do. And Nicole stopped me and she, in front of the class, she said to me, she's like, you have to stop. She's like, you were in so much pain and it is, you're going to end up with a hip replacement in five years if you do not stop everything that you're doing and do this corrective program. And like she had me in tears in front of the whole class, which was, was a vulnerable place for me to be at that time. But I right then and there, I'm like, she's right. Like it just Mm -hmm. hit my soul really hard. And I like, you know, she has a special place in my heart because of it. But so I stopped everything for six weeks and I took the corrective program and within two weeks I was pain free. Like it wow. was just like, I didn't think I would ever be pain free again. I thought it was something that I was going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. And, and within two weeks I was pain free. And so I, I kept going with it for another four weeks. And then I just found myself getting stronger and stronger and able to do things that like, like I always say, you know, if you can, if you can bench press 200 pounds on, you know, a normal bench press, I want to see you standing or kneeling on a, on a Swiss ball and pressing weight over your head. And let's actually see how strong you are, right? Because it's the basis, the stability system and, you know, your, your core and everything is actually how strong you are. And you can see it transfer into sport and you can see it transfer into just how you move dynamically throughout your day. And so that was, that was a turning point for me. That was like, oh yeah, like this is, yeah, this works. Mm. And so that was kind of my pain that led me into, I was already all in, but that just made me like, just have such, uh, you know, like a love for it. And it gave me exactly what I was looking for that oh, I can actually help people now. You know, I could take someone through a workout, but this is this is actually going to help people and give them something that I didn't feel anyone else, no other system, was able to give me in that injury. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Do you remember? Because I'm, you know, I love this this stuff. Do you remember? Like, was there 
was the one part of that that made all the difference? Is there something intuitively that you're like, oh, that exercise really helped me or that stretch really helped the way I felt? Or do you remember it back, back into that? So do you, have you guys ever had anyone come in with an obliquity? No, uh, no. Can you, can you, you know what um, that is? no. Okay. So when, with the pelvis, you can have a torsion, right? So a torsion is one hip is more anterior tilted than the other mm -hmm. well i had what was called an obliquity and it's actually one is rotated in more than the other right and so so it was nicole she was looking at me and she's like you have an obliquity i said i didn't know what that was and so she she basically just like went in and untangled my body and like you know, oblique and so as, and, you know, shoulders and everything like that. And, uh, yeah, that was like, that was the thing that got me out of pain so fast Yeah, was just unraveling what was happening there. And I've always said it was like, with my right hip, I had gone through like, um, a divorce that I didn't think I would ever go through. And it was like a really hard time. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, I remember I was, I was teaching a fitness class and I was, I was sprinting and I just felt my hip just like, it just went on me. Mm. I've, I'm sure you guys have been injured before, you know, mm. that feeling, right. And it just, it just went on me. And I was like, Oh, that's not good. That was bad. And, um, uh, and it was the, it was the energy of carrying like the, the heartbreak of that relationship right in that sacral chakra, right in my right hip. So I always call it my, my divorce injury, but it was the, <laughs> the physical thing that healed. And then there was a healing process, um, from the mental emotional side that I had to go through to, to like, I don't have any hip issues. It's like, I don't have any pain in that hip. It mm. feels great. It feels strong. And it was the whole process of, you know, and it was, it was probably a five-year process for me to get to that point wow. where it was never painful. Yeah. Well, wow. how good's that shit? God, this is a good, good universe. I got a girl that I took on recently. He's got a <clears throat> hip pain for sixteen years or something. So she's coming in soon. Actually, I haven't done an assessment with her, but that's I'm excited for that because I I actually like working with girls a lot more because I want I, I think I like the um the nurturing aspect of it or I feel like girls need it more. That's the, like because I grew up my mum my sister my dad was on the scene but he didn't live with me. Um, yeah, and. I just feel like girls have it h harder in the sense of, you know, if I eat, if I eat bread, my stomach's probably not going to bloat, even if I'm celiac, you know, as a guy, it's just the way it is. Right. But a girl, she'll eat some wrong thing and then she's bloating and then the period pain and then, yeah. yeah and then, and then, and then the, especially postnatal, like sometimes I'll see mums and you'll see <laughs> the postnatal fatigued mum posture. And yeah, it's forward head and it's a little posterior tilt with a hip shift and whatnot, you know. But I really don't see that as oh, tight hamstrings, weak abdominals, you know. I see that as like, oh, she's the girl's just tired, you know, like and okay. and, <laughs> yeah. and then that's where you think about, okay, I I think inspiring and I think I'm good at that is inspiring them to to make the change and inspiring them to what how how good we can get you, you know what I mean? And we can do this and we can do this and this is, and teaching them while doing it. I think that's important of, of without going too tech, but teaching them like, this is why you're doing this and this is what's this going to do. And this is why you look better here and whatnot. And, and then they do it and then they come back and you can see confidence is attached into that posture, not just the exercises. It's like, it's uplifting them and, and, and telling them why they're doing things. And I got all that from Walden, which is papers realizing the benefits, make the benefits real. I think that's just the Walden wisdom. It's just gold. <laughs> so hey. I always thought, yeah. yeah, the yeah. Hum the humblest wisdom you can ever get. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, isn't it? It's crazy and so simple. Like he makes it all so simple. Yeah. So yeah. Pack. For sure. And and what about what about your story? Did did, did you have to go through a well, process? Yeah. The, you know, I think both Heather and I. Are, well, if I may speak for us, we're we're very Yang people. And so it, the physical stuff was, was the entry, the doorway in, I love moving, I loved, and I was brought to, uh, I was gifted. I worked at the very first, it was called Sports Training Institute in New York City. It was the only personal training gym. In, it was like a novel thing. This is back in wow. 1992. 
Mm-hmm. It was, there was no other gym that ever, it was the weirdest thing. Like, wait, you have to make an appointment to go. <laughs> yeah. So all of you were a little younger, but like that never was a thing. You would just go to the gym. And so this was all for elite athletes. It was for um, politicians. It was for the elite of New York City. And when I got hired there, I, you know, it, it was my day job. I was an actor. This was like, yeah. well, I wonder what time I can be done. Yeah. And, really, you know, as with most things, it was my purpose. And like you said, then when things just come flowing and easy to you, you started like, I don't even know how, wait, how am I here? How am I doing this? Because <laughs> it just flowed to me. It was, that was, that job was gifted to me. And then they made me the head of the department. Then they trained me as, you know, a, and that at back at the, in that time, they trained sports specific training. You know, they had protocols for, because it was all, you know, the elite, this is, this guy's a New York giant. This guy's on whatever that baseball team is called. Mm. <laughs> you know? And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, anyway, so we're going to, mm-hmm. you know, and I was very much in the movement modality, right? I was a yoga person. I, so I was doing all of their mobility work and I was trained by physical therapists. So I had that certain perspective. And then I was also trained by um, massage therapists because we had the same space. So I'd get on their table. And so I had this kind of think and touch beginning nice. and just kind of, you know, I, they sports training was bought by a huge corporation as it became like a normal thing to have. And, and I didn't want to go. And so a bunch of the clients, all these elite New Yorkers were like, well, just come to my house. I was like, well, but I'm not a trainer. Like I'm an actress. (laughs) And they're like, well, just, you know, for a while. And I was like, all right. And so this would beginning of my purpose, right? Like, and so, so I still have some of those clients from sports training wow. days and I have grown with them and they have grown with me. What did I need to learn? They were getting a knee replacement. I need to learn about, okay, so let's, let's, so talking to the best, you know, uh, you know, osteo people and the best orthopedic people, because that's who my clients are seeing. I had had been gifted this education and I didn't really, I just, it was too easy. Yeah. And then my son was having, oh, then I met Paul and he made me so angry <laughs> because he told me I was an idiot for being a vegetarian. <laughs> and I was so in my dogma. I was like, how dare he tell me that I was an airhead and I couldn't, you know, put two thoughts together because I didn't have enough meat. And, you know, I was like <laughs> offended. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you know, when, now I know when I'm really angered by something, it's, there's a boundary that someone has stepped on that maybe I need to look at. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now my husband and I joke, like anytime someone offends me, he goes, oh, there's something you need to learn. Yeah. And it's like, that's why it really offended me because he was right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sucks so being wrong. Really <laughs> not and I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have done it for myself. Just my son was having a hard time growing. And he was a vegetarian. He was, and this is the wonderful, horrible thing about being a parent is I had gifted him my dogma and he was, um, you know, in, in elementary school and he's now six foot four and he was having this growth spurt and I could see his body, like his energy was lacking. And so I started doing all of this research and I was like, oh my God, mm. we need to eat. Mm. Wow. Well. Fuck, that's that's powerful, eh? That's so powerful. And and did you just start integrating meat into his diet and did you see a change? We had a family meeting. <laughs> no, he was logic age, and I just I said, you okay, go, sweetie, you know, I've I think mommy was wrong. And yeah. and I'm so sorry. i so, I feel so terrible, but I think you're having a hard time paying attention at school and a hard time running as fast as the other kids because I'm not giving the right energy. And, you know, now what I'm learning is that all of that soy product that I've been giving you is actually really not good for you. And so could we try? And so we started with two nights a week, we had meat and he had rules, no babies. So he didn't want to eat lamb. Mm -hmm. You know, like, 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 so he had like created this compassionate relationship with meat, but I had contorted it. Anyway, <laughs> now he mostly eats meat and, yeah. you know, he's very healthy, but it was a great, like Paul brought to me that because he made me angry 
And I had to move out of just the physical and understand that the foundation of my ability to perform in this body is what I put into this body. And, you know, I still, I think there's still cycles and times for people to shift, you know, for either to go all carnivores. A lot of my clients have done, they, there's this huge push this year. I don't know if you guys are feeling it, but everyone wanted to go all carnivore Mm -hmm. for their January cleanse. And I was like, (laughs) okay, support you in that as long as you keep pooping, Mm. right? Yeah. We're going to talk if you're getting constipated. And, you know, could we say that, you know, two stalks of celery before, you know, every meal is you know, could we just make that deal? You know, so like making these negotiations, like understanding that black and white is probably dogma. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's just a pendulum. You just got to sit in the middle. (laughs) Or let yourself, or let yourself sway with it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and, you know, the lack of rigidity and I'm, I'm so, you know, I've been stuck so hard in my blacks and whites and, but just tell me, is this right or wrong? What, what do I do? And so I attract those clients. Right. And, you know, now I'm like, well, let's muscle test you. Mm. Us. What your body tells us. Yeah. Let's check in with your. You know, maybe this is a time for you to be a vegetarian. Maybe this is a time for you to be all carnivore. I don't know. Let's ask. And then let's be willing to build a relationship with self where we're really listening and be willing to abandon it. Even if you told everyone on social media that you're going to go 30 days carnivore, if you get four days into it and you realize it's not serving you, could we just say, hey, guys, you know what? My body said no. Mm. Yeah, it's um, and I've 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 just noticed. I don't know. I don't know if you've noticed. Like, they their bio starts to stink a little bit. I've noticed that. Yeah. Get acidic. Yeah, I was like, wonder what that is. It's like whenever they go to the carnivore, I'm like, whoa, like okay, they're starting to stink a little bit, you know. And I've only ever had that same smell if I've like drank alcohol and eaten bad food. I've noticed the next day my sweat will stink for about two days, then it goes away. That's a little co- – how, how obvious is that in yeah. some sense of toxicity? I know. But people don't realize that. Mine was coffee. If I have two coffees instead of one, really, I would. I could smell. I'm like, so oh. it's acidic. Oh, so there you go, an acidic. Is that – Like cortisol. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. acidic because when you think of our vegetables, they're the alkalinity in our diet, right? Mm-hmm. They bring us back to alkaline. Mm. And so when we go to just meat um, – there's so much protein synthesis that's happening is that it sends us into a state of acidity and it's, that's, you know, and that's, I think why it's so important to remember that pendulum, like you talked about Jake, Mm -hmm. is that there, there really is a time and a place. Like, you know, you look at the research and, you know, carnivore can heal certain, you know, conditions and be really beneficial for, for some things for a period of time Mm -hmm. and vegetarian, ism can be you know healing for a certain period of time but if we stay on either end of those spectrums for too long and we we're going to feel the polarity right we're going to have to bring ourselves back to that that neutral and find our balance and it's not going to look the same for everyone you know someone you know someone's going to do better on more of a protein-based diet and someone might do better you know kind of 50 50 on that ratio so it's all about you know looking at your body like you said Mm -hmm. Karina checking in with your soul I don't know was it after IMS4 that you know we have a a group um chat that we're always on and we're all peeing on our our uh, (laughs) our pH strips to make (laughs) sure that we're not acidic (laughs) you know it's like the check-in, yeah. the check-in to see where your body's at and how it's responding to what you're putting in it. And then um, one thing that Paul said to us in IMS 5 is he's like, um, you have to be brave enough to listen to your soul. Yeah. So your soul's not always going to tell you what you want to hear. And it might lead you down some hard paths, but it will always tell you the right path. And so then you just have to be brave enough to to follow that path. So. So we might get stuck in our in our dogma and our ism sometimes. And if we do that check in, it's going to lead us in the right direction. And we just have to like be like, I asked. Yeah. I, so now I have to listen, right? For sure. I, I, I think about like soul guidance and I think about like looking into ourself. And like you said before about being triggered, 
I feel like your triggers or where you lose your center is the best place to start for figuring out where the work lies. Like, like you said, like if someone was like to trigger you and, and you, and you had to look into that, it's such, that's where the biggest soul growth comes is when you can look into yourself and go, fuck, that's, that hurts to go there, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to grow from it. Yeah, totally. It shows you where your work needs to be, right? It's the best feeling ever. (laughs) Oh, this is, yeah, this is where your, where your focus needs to be. You need to work on this part of yourself. And it is, it's like, that's what makes life good is like, oh, I, I get to do better and be better and keep reaching for something like new within myself every day. That's that joy that you can tap into. Hey, that's, that's, that's like for, for me so far in life, I feel like that's been the biggest that like Michael Singer talks about the river of joy that's always there inside of us and you need to find it and drown in it. And the closest I've been to that, I feel, is just knowing that my purpose here uh, is to is to love myself enough to work on those triggers and keep growing to help other people. It's just yeah. it, it's what it feels like. Mm-hmm. It's like it, that's that joy, that feeling. With your uh, your project, your your book, could, would you be able to explain to mm. the, to the listeners just about what inspired that and and what and what is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, we were. Through? Yeah, we never met <laughs> each other actually, because this was during COVID, and we had done classes together, but by circumstance, we were never. We were either both online or one of us was online, so. And then Heather calls me up out of the blue and is like, hi, I'm Heather. Do you remember me? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I sure. And she's like, I want to do this project. And I said, yeah, I want to do that course as well. And we need to write the book for the course. And that was it. We took off. We actually didn't meet until we'd finished writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's cool. <laughs> We just, you know, I'm in New York City. She's in, you know, Calgary. And mm. we just, it that again, just flowed. It just, yeah. we just, it was meant to be written. And of course, it's all the foundation of what we've learned in the Czech system. But what we realized is that for us to be successful, we needed a community. And this is, you know, we have a soul group that from our Czech, right, that we check. I mean, honestly, we talk almost every day, our mm-hmm. Czech group. And just like, you know, in corrective culture, you have this soul group of people who are kind of keeping you on track or like expanding your vision. Mm. And what we wanted to do, because Heather and I are both, I'm one-on-one with, I've, like I said, my, my schedule has been full since, you know, the nineties yeah. and to get a slot in my schedule, it's, you know, someone's either out of town or unwell and you have to be on a wait list. And so my knowledge has been tied up with these 12 people mm. Mm. and they're beautiful 12 people that I have been able to serve and grow with. But what I've learned is really intended for the world. And so Heather and I, we just decided that we need to reach this broader audience with what we know. And it's, you know, it's a very simple way to implement what we've learned. It's 24 weeks and there's a focus for every week. And, you know, there's every, the end of every chapter, there are actions that you can take one to seven different, and you can opt to just do one of them, or you could do all seven if you're, you know, if you're an A student. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted was to create a place where people could support each other, just like you guys have created, right? Mm. Where what we're celebrating at the water cooler in the morning is how much we slept, not how much we drank. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. How good is that? That's so cool. And so, I mean, we've got 24 chapters, we've got 24 topics, and that's our whole purpose now is just speaking those truths and progressing people like we did through the ideas and into ourselves. And, you know, by having the actionable plans at the end of, it's not just, you know, we we like to say that the knowledge, of course, every book is full of knowledge, but what really creates the potential for habit formation and change is the community. And that's what you guys do so beautifully. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and that is cool. That is, that is cool talking about how much you slept. You yeah, know, yeah. that's what that's what we've that's noticed. That's going into sure. the highlight reel of the, of yeah. the, um, the 
Yeah, the real, the real when we, when we post the potty, that'll be a little snippet. I, for I sure. think that's what we're, we're we're trying to do as well. We're trying to make it cool to not go out and get fucked up on drugs and alcohol. Like you know, there's a time and a place when you're young to if you want to explore, but fuck, it's way cooler to talk about how much you slept and look at your aura, compare aura ring scores. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's and like it's, even with all the stuff you guys do with jujitsu, like yeah, you probably have the best you know, group of friends, mm. you know, doing something that, you know, you're all doing together. It, you know, bonds you together and you're doing something that's good for you. Right. It's serving mm, you. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's such a, it's such a nice place to be. And it's such a different way instead of, you know, what you could be doing, like going to the bars or, you know, mm. all those sorts of things. Like it's going to bond you on a different level than that ever could. Yeah. And there's a, there's, I think there's a level of self-respect that comes with it and and respect from others that come with it, especially when you get to a certain age. Like once you're past your mid-20s, when you start to see someone bendering still, there's a level of sadness attached to it from the people that aren't doing it. You see that and you see, oh, okay, like that's very unfulfilling and it's very not opposite of king and queen archetype, right? <laughs> um and, yeah, then, exactly. and then when you see people that are doing it, it's respectable and you almost want to be around them because it's yeah. like you can have a like you can have multimillionaire, but if you're not in control what's put in your mouth, there's a level of ick. Yeah. <laughs> that, I agree. That that um that I see like, oh, this person's not really in control of that yet, you know? And then we all have things that we're all trying to improve on, but it's like it comes with practice and and when you get into the check stuff, like I started off just changing my water and I started doing this and veggies and and all that and then it becomes so normal and it becomes something that's not a a uh it doesn't feel like discipline anymore it just feels like life you know no it's and not a challenge yeah. yeah yeah exactly it's not a challenge and i think when I, we meet like two girls like you two women like you whatever <laughs> um <laughs> that that it's it's it yeah. makes me feel like we're on the right path because you look so healthy and you look so centered and you look uh What's another adjective? I wish I had my vocabulary, but I don't need to improve on that. But <laughs> but you you just look like you're you you're on your path and 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 unique and unique in 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 the the archetype of the like like I say, I'm constantly just seeing the archetype of the fatigued mum, the fatigue like oh just like constantly tired, not in control, having four almond coffees in the morning, you know. And when we see that, you both look so healthy even through the camera. Yeah, in your power, yeah. Yeah, in your power, yeah. Mm. And on your path and vitality, it's, it makes me feel like, yes, we're on the right – we already knew it, but – Yeah, the right, I, the right I know, circle, I know. You know. But like, yeah. It's the confirmations, yeah. Yeah, it is. I think one thing that Karina and I are both huge on, and it's kind of something that I think, you know, when we were looking at 24 and we were talking about what our – you know, our, our dreams and our goals and what our focus was. Something that really came up for me this year was it's just living a life that you're excited for every day mm-hmm. and that you don't have to always be looking forward to something that's happening in the future. Like you're not looking forward to the weekend. You're not looking forward to so that true. glass of wine at night. You're not looking forward to the vacation. Like they're all, you know, can be part of your life but if you create a life that you're not looking to escape from all the time like you actually get out of bed and you're excited about the things that you get to do or you feel purposeful mm. it's a game changer that's it yeah. Yeah. that's that's you figured it out that's it, eh? <laughs> saturday's the same as monday yeah. yeah saturday and you see like paul like living his living his true sense like you can you, i really respect people like that who have like their family life sorted their financial life sorted like i look at it he's such a king and he's and he's got everything sorted and that's like that's such that's up on the pedestal for me still because it's like that's that's how that's who i respect now i don't respect the athlete that's got a million followers and drinks red bull anymore i drink someone who's got their relationships in order and their finances in order and is offering something bigger to the planet and i think that that's like a Mm. yeah, yeah it's cool so for people to uh find your guys stuff find your book find and were you having an online course also or was it yeah so yeah. we have a course go, go ahead, ahead, ahead no you go i'll oh, go, no. I'll, okay. I'll go. <laughs> 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 you know it's funny because everything that you've kind of hit on callan with the working mom is the reason why that's our first focus nice. for what we're 
the the group, the tribe and the community that we want to create is because we've both experienced, you know, a working mom wears a lot of hats. It's mm. there's a lot of things that come onto your plate and it's, you know, right from being you're working, but you're usually still in charge about 80 percent of the stuff that's happening in the home. Um, you're raising the kids, you could be cooking the meals, you're the taxi driver, mm-hmm. you are the psychologist, you're, you know, helping with homework. You, there's just so many dynamics that come with motherhood. And I know for myself, and I know for Karina, it's a pull sometimes. It's the mom that I want to be is, is time consuming. Like I, I have a lot of time that I want to offer my kids and, you know, the legacy that I want to live, leave with them, that they were always the most important, you know, thing in my life and that I was always there for them. Uh, but at the same time, I have this, this other purpose in my life as a coach and as, you know, wanting to be the best that I can be for my clients and help them to the best of my ability there. So you know, it's finding the balance, like not living in either polarity, because I've done it where I put too much time into my business and my coaching. And my kids feel that lack. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm, you know, you know, I'm going into, um, we're right in the midst of our sports season. So we're going to be traveling a lot for my kids sports. And that's where my my attention has to be. So then I feel sometimes like, there's a lack that I can give my business and my clients during that time. Mm. So I know there's a lot of moms out there Mm. that have those struggles and have those feelings and they feel like they're being pulled in, in many different directions. And so what Karina and I want to offer is the balance. It's how do you, first of all, come to the place where you're okay, that there's a time and a place to focus on this. And there's a time and a place to focus on this. And it might not all be at once. Like I'm not going to be able to fully dive into everything that I possibly want to within my career at this point in my life where I, you know, I have kids that I'm still, I'm still raising, but I can know that that time I can do what I can now that time is coming that I have to be okay with that and I have to you know be at peace with that and I think that's a big portion of what we want to do is we want to do it here are the tools to take care of yourself because your eye is always going to come before we otherwise you have nothing to give you can only love to the capacity that you love yourself and so teaching moms to love themselves first and then finding the balance of okay, how do I keep the balance in taking care of my kids and seeing what I have left to offer the all after I've I've come to that place of of managing myself and being responsible for myself and empowering myself to raise these children and then still feel like I have purpose and meaning in what I'm doing for my community. Yeah. Well, so that's what we're offering. Yes. Yeah. On the practical and- level, like everything we wanted as a working mom, it's at the beginning of every month, we start a new group on Wednesday nights. And for the whole month, you get to opt in, we have live coaching, we have live workouts, we have live work ins, we have recipes, thanks to Heather and her magic in the kitchen. And so all the stuff that made us stressed out as working mothers, like you get home, and you're like, how am I gonna, we schedule it with you. And then, like you know, if it's on your schedule and you have people, a community that's expecting you that to adhere, hey, where were you? I thought you were going to show up for Monday night, whatever. Now you are taking what you say you want, you're putting it in your schedule, and you're teaching your kids by showing them how to prioritize our health. And this is how we do it. We don't let mommy always be the last. We don't, you know, let mommy get totally flattened where she's in tears, locked herself behind the bathroom door, mm-hmm. right? And so that like, how, how are we going to coach balance to our kids if we don't show them balance in our lives? So that's really what we wanted to provide. So it's called the Nurturing Mother Group. And we are starting, we're starting with the women and the mothers because we feel very mm. like that. That's our first call. But um, we already have our plans for just... Um, one of my friends was like, and where's the gay men's group? So maybe that'll be our next. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> Hell yeah. 
<laughs> you know? So it's it's applying to the community and creating communities that support themselves then. And that and mm-hmm. there now you have people who are like minded and that you can like we have a soul group that is like, hey, how's this going? Oh my God, that was really hard for me, but I showed up for myself. And will the time frame uh be there for like say if there's girls in Australia that I'm sure there is, because most of our following is actually uh females. So for girls in Australia does the time uh, match up? Yeah, so um, it would be for them, it would be in the morning, mm-hmm. right? If they wanted to join for the um, live stuff. Yeah. And, you know, so it would just, you know, like we like to say anyway, if you need time for yourself as a working mother, you're probably going to want to just get up a little earlier than everyone else because <laughs> yeah. that's the only guaranteed time in your home yeah. where you can do your meditation work or do whatever serves you to prepare yourself for your life. So mm-hmm. yeah, it would be a, it would be an, a morning group. And then of cool. course, everything's always recorded, but we much yeah. prefer people, you know, like it's always better if you show up in for person sure. and, for sure. be and, fat, and where right? can they get the book? So that's all. If you go to our website, www.thewayholistic, thewayholistic.com, um, so the we wanted to offer to your group mm-hmm. um, because we really think you guys are actually doing something that we really believe in. Um, just the digital book, in case that's the only time that the mothers have, and it's just what they can eat. And right now, <laughs> yeah, every chapter there's there are things to do. If you just follow along in the book, mm-hmm. you will make progress. What is that? One percent better. Every week, fifty-two percent better. I think, right? Yeah. So, please, yes, right. Yeah. So, the book. If you go to the way holistic and you put um, dot com and you put in to our newsletter your name, your email, and put in the um, field below that, right? Corrective culture. Mm-hmm. We're going to send you that book for five American dollars because oh, wow. yeah, legends. Yeah, yeah. We feel like that's really important. <clears throat> um, also, we had the January buddy system. So anyone who's signing up in January with a friend, it's two for one for the course. Wow. And those, we've written it down. You can do month by month. It's um, much cheaper if you sign up for all six months at once. But, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's different with what they can um, forecast, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, that's that's so cool. Yeah, that's um really exciting, Re- really exciting to get this out to so it, it's the the book is for for mums marketed towards the them. book is for everyone book is for anyone. oh right cool cool the group that we've started the first live group we started was for the mums yeah. and that it's all based on the book the book is a workbook and so it's it is the foundation and anyone you know who follows along or as one of my friends said he just like reads a chapter every few weeks and just tries to apply it as his focus of the week. So awesome. it, it does filter in. It's just like everything. You need to be yeah. introduced to the notions a couple of times and then the community that does it a hundred times. And then suddenly, like you said, it's just what you do, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know if you were somewhere and someone said, oh, check people. I know you guys, you bring your own food. <laughs> <laughs> fully yeah that's, that's so true that's, that's so true, true. <laughs> that's so true man. yeah it's funny I'm in this Diane course I'm doing this one other checkie and he brings his own food and, and everyone else goes and gets fucking chips and shit you know like <laughs> that's yeah. hilarious yeah it's, it's yeah. crazy um, cool. All right. Well, yeah. Thank, thanks for the podcast, guys. Thank yeah. you so much. It's so good to connect, and um, I really feel as though we're going to connect a lot more in the future. Yeah. I really want to spend more time in the states and Canada, so I'll definitely reach out to you guys. I'd love to yeah. come and meet you in person, and we want to film over there, and we want to come and visit. And yeah. so, yeah, we, we've got to do it. That'd be that'd be cool. Yeah. Really. Um, yeah. For sure. Love the for chat. Sure. Yeah. Love the chat. And, I would um, love to see you in New York City. I'm an empty nester, so there's always an empty bed. Oh, no, oh, no way. Jake about, loves New York. Yeah, I'm so, like, I know it's a masculine city, and I'm, yeah, I've, I've read David, I think it's David Dider's book on it, and he talks about how if you're really drawn to New York City, you've got a really masculine thing, and I was like, yes, because I just think about it all the time. I went to, I stayed in Williamsburg for, like, six weeks, and I loved it. Yeah. That just the bridge for me i'm the lower east side oh sick lower east side nice yeah. oh yeah go. well there yeah. you go i'll definitely have to come say hi i just yeah loved it over no there brick. yeah i'm no. getting my visa sorted so i reckon i'll be i'll be over there we'll be over there hopefully this year yeah sure yeah that definitely 
Definitely yeah. this year. Yeah. Photos of your snowboarding adventures. I'm so jealous yeah. of, you know, yeah. you and the snow. Oh, here oh, we come. I know, I know. I'm just looking. I just, the mountain energy there is crazy. Like I can't wait to just oh. reset, yeah. you know, just ground in some good nature. And then you come back and you're just like, oh, let's go. <laughs> yeah, driven. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And See. it's And it's not cold. So you're like, it's powder. and Yeah, it's like yeah. six minus six tops kind of thing so it's just perfect that's yeah. perfect yeah it's good powder it's not slushy yeah that's yeah. that's the best conditions you could ask for i love right. it right, yeah well it. so much love to you guys yeah we'll um we'll keep in touch with you and um yeah we'll make a bunch of reels and stuff and send them your way and um yeah to all the listeners out there i hope you enjoyed this one yeah much love from Definitely. the corrective culture soul family let's yeah. keep growing <laughs> thank you thanks guys right, bye. see you later